Welcome Vintage Hollywood Archive. Shirley MacLaine's illustrious career includes a succession of spirited performances that have stood this test of time, as well as a long line of collaborations with Hollywood's top names. In every decade, this legendary actress's body of work, which spans 40 years, is defined by multiple dramatic appearances and award-winning performances. This well-known actress has appeared in Broadway musicals, television shows, and films in roles ranging from glamorous to eccentric. She played a small-town girl, a first lady, a free-spirited hippie, a sensitive elevator operator, an eccentric piano instructor, and a fashion goddess in films that have intrigued and amused audiences all over the world. Why Shirley MacLaine decided to be in an open marriage Before we move on with this video, kindly like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Shirley MacLaine she could make people laugh and cry at the same time. She's been in over 60 films, has written 12 books, and directed documentaries and an indie play. She has been chastised for her interest in New Age notions such as out-of-body experiences, many reincarnations, and paranormal phenomena. She, on the other hand, shows no signs of slowing down. She is now well known as everyone's favorite crazy aunt or effervescent granny in supporting parts in films and television series. In 1934, the American actress, dancer, activist, and author was born into a cliché-loving, middle-class Virginia family, according to her own words. Ira O. Beattie, her father, was a psychologist, a school administrator, a realtor, and an amateur pianist. Her mother, Catherine Corinne Beattie, was born in Nova Scotia, Canada, and was described as a tall, slim, almost ethereal creature with a passionate temperament. McLean's mother, a theater teacher who enjoyed poetry and the theater, took her to ballet when she was three years old as a treatment for weak ankles. My imagination took anchor there, she wrote, and my energy found a channel. What began as therapy has turned into my life. I have orphan psychology, that's what I've been told, McLean stated of her youth. Because my parents were constantly busy, I had to get up early when I was about 11 to get to school and then ballet class by myself. I was the one who had to figure out how to go around on the buses and streetcars. I had no one to chat to because my parents had gone to bed by the time I arrived home. So I had to constantly ask myself, who am I, to navigate those waters, simply to make it home each day. I arrived in New York at 18, wide-eyed, optimistic, brave, and certain I would crash the world of show business overnight. She spent the summer of her junior year in high school in New York performing in the Subway Circuit production of Oklahoma, and then returned after graduation. A masochistic sense of humor is a needed characteristic to survive in New York. McLean decided to spice up the spice one night while on tour. She wore a gorgeous white tutu, blacked out front teeth, and a saintly grin while dancing as Queen of the Swans around a servile ice maker in the show's grand finale. She was dismissed and returned to New York. At a pub on West 45th Street, McLean met producer and businessman Steve Parker, who proposed to her four hours later. She was performing in the chorus of Broadway's Me and Juliet at the time. Steve and I met in 1952, but our involvement was so intense that we didn't get married until 1954, she stated. She was an understudy for Carol Haney in the Broadway hit The Pajama Game at the time. McLean continued without rehearsals after Haney torn a ligament in her ankle, having only seen four times from the wings. She hurried a sentence out of nervousness, then realized she needed to slow down her delivery. All of a sudden, I had the flow of communication that I had yearned for my entire life. The magnetism, the current, traveling from one human being to the others and back again like a big pendulum, was what fulfilled me, not the applause and laughter. You were good, Bob Fosse, the show's choreographer, informed her as she exited the stage. Good energy. It was from Fosse that I realized energy was the most important requirement for a good performance on stage, screen, and in life, she said. Producer Hal B. Wallace offered McLean a contract with Paramount Pictures the next night. She eventually signed, returned to the choir, and awaited a call from Hollywood. A representative of filmmaker Alfred Hitchcock spotted her two months later when she was on again for Haney. He was working on a film called The Trouble with Harry, 
and was seeking for an unconventional kooky woman to play the lead. For her work in this film, McLean won the Golden Globe for New Star of the Year, Actress. Wallace pulled me from the shelf to garnish a Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis product, she said about her second film, Artists and Models, about which she wrote. I stood in for all the plain ladies in the audience who couldn't get a man until they pinned him to the floor. That's probably when I first understood I could make people laugh and cry at the same time. If I stayed in Hollywood, I'll always be Mr. McLean, Parker informed McLean just before moving to Japan in 1956. He was the person I cared most about, my major relationship, and the man I would wait for until he established his own identity in the world. Meanwhile, I was free to operate as I pleased in Hollywood and around Hollywood's hills and dales, and he was free to do the same in Japan or elsewhere. Until their marriage dissolved in 1982, they had an open relationship. Parker told Time magazine in 1984, I don't think we could have stayed together for 30 years any other way. Shirley is a free spirit who needs to get away. McLean was romantically linked to several well-known men, including actor Robert Mitchum, Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palm, Canadian Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, comedian actor Danny Kay, actor-singer Yves Montand, Australian Foreign Minister Andrew Peacock, and journalist author Pete Hamill. Between 1955 and 1970, McLean appeared in 25 films, including Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin's Some Came Running, Jack Lemon's The Apartment and Irma La Douce, Audrey Hepburn's The Children's Hour, and Bob Fosse's directorial debut, Sweet Charity. She traveled extensively during this time and became politically involved at home, supporting Robert F. Kennedy for president, pushing for civil rights, and protesting the Vietnam War. She wrote her first autobiographical bestseller in 1970, and she would go on to publish 13 more over the years, all while continuing to perform to great acclaim in the movies, on television, and stage. These books, which are essentially a record of McLean's life's journey, are written with boldness and question traditional Western mores and beliefs, as well as the fundamental nature of reality itself. Don't Fall Off the Mountain is a pleasantly and loosely written and entirely on her own, which is Miss McLean's way of doing things, an autobiography of the charming gamine film presence who turns out to be completely other kinds of person altogether, according to Kirkus Reviews. McLean recalls her middle-class Virginia childhood with tenderness in it, recalling her supportive but aloof mother, her dictatorial father, and her brother, actor and director, Warren Beatty. She wrote, He was my kid brother, and we were pals, in fact, comrades. We had to be if we didn't want to end up like this, competing for favor as a result of our parents' inadvertently created competitiveness. She credits her early exposure to the world of dance with instilling in her a work ethic that would serve her well throughout her career, from Broadway to Hollywood stardom, marriage and motherhood, politics, and international travel. She wrote, I discovered something about myself that still holds. I can't enjoy anything unless I put forth a lot of effort. Her writing shows a vibrancy that seems commensurate with her views, according to a 1971 Newsweek review. Her sanity and equilibrium, as well as her willingness to reject or assimilate experiences with her eyes, mind, and heart wide open, are what makes her story so compelling. You Can Get There From Here picks up in Hollywood in 1970 when television was keeping the studios alive, and television was what had gravely injured them. Television and the American culture itself, according to McLean. There was nothing in the trade journals about Vietnam, poverty, bigotry, or how the bold American ideal seemed to be disintegrating around us. It was a political value priority pledge I made to myself, she said, referring to her 1972 campaign for presidential candidate George McGovern. She led an all-female delegation on a trip to mainland China in 1973, at the invitation of the People's Republic of China. The gang began to disintegrate soon after they arrived. She had a lot of love affairs, but she didn't have a lot of sexual affairs. She didn't have the sophistication for that. She needed to be able to express herself emotionally. Her interactions with my male pals were less tense, and they were more equal and honest. They told each other the truth when the sexual component slowed down. Her close female pals, whose personal life was slowing them down as well, were her lifelong friends. She discussed what they did for love and how it felt when the sexual attraction faded. When she reflected on her life, she pondered what she was doing with all of her hormones, attraction, and longings, especially because she had always felt a strong desire for independence. 
the majority of the men she was with desired to marry her. Shirley was in an open marriage with businessman Steve Parker for 30 years until their divorce in 1982, and she kept it that way for the rest of her life so that it wouldn't be a problem. When it came to each other's lovers, her spouse and she had a permissive arrangement. They were buddies who decided to stay married so they wouldn't be tempted to remarry. She couldn't see the point of marriage, and she could never live a life where she felt obligated to keep a commitment she made because her love hormones were running at the time. She had always been attracted to her male co-stars, to be honest. She was captivated by masculine actors. Everyone on the outside was curious about what goes on behind the scenes on a movie shoot. When filming a love scene, if an aggressive actor strips down to his underwear and jumps on the top of the leading lady, who may or may not strip down to hers in turn, the crew will immediately switch to lighting and moving equipment. The director will wave his hand to continue filming and say, Okay, this is good for the characters. The publicist will roll his eyes. The front office will hear about it and start gossiping. And if the two underclad actors like each other, the events described above occurred in real life. It occurred to several co-stars, even Shirley on occasion. She was once determined to be brave like everyone else during a campaign. One day, she had sex with three different men. She claimed it was pointless and unsatisfactory. When Jack Kennedy visited Hollywood before becoming president, he frequently drove her in his convertible. They'd go to Mulholland Drive and converse while looking out over the city lights. He never made a move toward her. Indeed, she was perplexed as to what was wrong with her. It was a different story being in Bobby Kennedy's company. Bobby and his colleagues once invited a group of Hollywood types to spend a weekend in Palm Springs during the Kennedy campaign. They retired to their hotel rooms sometime after midnight. Shirley's door opened when she was partly sleeping, and a man climbed into bed with her. She had no idea who it was. She collapsed to the ground. She needed to know a little something about the person with whom she was having sex. The man got out of bed and walked away. She returned to her bed. Another man entered 15 minutes later and slid into bed with her. She, too, had no idea who he was. She rolled out of bed and onto the floor once more. This continued all night until she gave up and went to sleep on the floor. She didn't know who the men were or if they were the same man. Everyone had vanished by the time she awoke the next morning. Perhaps this was how the Kennedy crowd did sex, in secret. But how about the story behind Deborah Winger and Shirley MacLaine's Hollywood feud? The epic feud between Deborah Winger and Shirley MacLaine still makes headlines 35 years after they crafted a beloved Hollywood classic. While filming terms, Winger and MacLaine had a tense relationship that matched the on-screen tension between their characters, Emma Greenway and her cantankerous mother, Aurora. Both women were nominated for the Academy Awards for Best Actress, but MacLaine won the award, exclaiming, I deserve this, during her acceptance speech. When McLean and Winger first met to work on the film based on Larry McMurtry's heartfelt bestseller, they didn't get along. The Winger was a rising star after starring in 1980's Urban Cowboy, while McLean was a Hollywood veteran with three Oscar nominations. They had nothing in common but talent. Do you know who Deborah Winger is? In a 1984 interview with People, McLean said, I didn't know the name. I had no idea who she was. We were all nervous when they were first introduced, director-screenwriter James L. Brooks said in the same People piece. I was wearing all my spare movie star fur jackets to test how my character would feel, McLean explained. Deborah was wearing combat boots and a miniskirt. Oh my goodness. The tone for the pair's on-screen squabbles was set. McLean was restrained, whereas Winger was defiant and provocative. No one can figure out what's going on in the relationship, Brooks added. Not even the contestants, said the narrator. On screen, the upshot was a bracingly complex mother-daughter relationship, if not a particularly enjoyable set. A lot of the time, we knew what we were doing, sparring back and forth, Winger recalled. It was a down-to-earth approach to work. We were regarded as insane at Paramount. Winger's approach did not sit well with McLean. When it was time to make her mark on set, her demanding co-star shouted to her to come over here, she recalled in her 1995 autobiography, My Lucky Stars. I said, I heard you. I recognize marks when I see them, writes McLean in her book. All right, Winger said. How about this for our grade? She moved away from me, turned around, hiked her skirt slightly, looked over her shoulder, 
bent over, and farted in my face. The winger told the New York Times in 1986, I can't deny that we fought. We're not eating lunch together today. We put ourselves to the test, and after we were done at that, we both got tired. I believe there was always mutual respect between us. There are many different ways to make a marriage work well. Clark Gable and Carol Lombard were Hollywood's perfect match. But, as is often the case, their relationship also ended, but how and why? Watch this video and find out. How was Carol Lombard and Clark Gable's love ruined by a flip of a coin?